thank you, Jacob, for agreeing to uh, participate in this. Good chats, to be here. It's fun. Chats on machine behavior. We're trying to start that uh, field. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But at least we'll have some some nice conversations, and uh, maybe maybe we'll we'll get this into the world. Um, I wanted to start by really talking about what you've been able to master over the last uh, 10 years, which is uh, AI, human cooperation. And I want to ask you, why do you think that cooperation is so important? Uh, what do you think is so hard? And how did you decide to devote your academic life so far to that research yeah. subject? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um... I think the math behind human-machine cooperation intrigues me because it's it's not very clean. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, why not? Uh, it, well, it's not clean because I mean the foundations I think are within game theory. There's often multiple equilibria um, under the assumption of rationality, but we don't actually know if the other player is rational or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a under a whole bunch of different assumptions, you make a different assumption and you get a different answer. And so I think that's intriguing to figure out. And then on top of that, cooperation isn't always the equilibrium solution. Um, and because of that, I just think it, it creates a very messy but interesting math problem. So cooperation like, in itself, why do you think human cooperation, forgetting leaving AI outside, why do you think human cooperation is so hard? Um, just because our incentives don't align and then the it's computationally complex to figure out what is going to be a cooperative solution and it's built on a lot of assumptions that we're not sure about so we might might believe that we might hope that someone is going to be cooperative mm -hmm. but we have different suspicions and trust and as we try to read all the different signals we and then it conflicts sometimes with our own self-interest. So there's just a lot of things heaped on top of an already complex environment. Un human cooperation, very unstructured. We don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and so, so yeah, just be, even with human cooperation, it's just extremely complex. Um, and our emotions and our suspicions and our selfish desires often get in the way of it. And uh, do, do you think human cooperation is already solved? For sure, we have been doing it for centuries. I read today that um, the best estimate for the length of civilization is 9,000 years. So we've been cooperating for maybe a fraction of that. Do you think human cooperation is already solved? Given that you're working yeah. on human AI cooperation, do you think that <laughs> well, definitely easier not. level I mean, is already solved? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, I don't know how, what, what you would constitute as solved. Um, do we understand the rules of human cooperation? Do we understand what, what brings about human yep. cooperation? Um, to some degree, I think there's been a lot written on this. Um, genetic, genetic similarity. Genetic was a similarity, economic studies. Uh -huh. um, it's been studied in just about every single field because cooperation is central to everything we do, I think. Um, being said, do we understand it fully? I, I don't think so. I don't think we have the models to to fully study it, right? The world's very complex. Sometimes we boil it down to a simple model, like a prisoner's dilemma, something like that. But I don't, mm -hmm. I don't believe that necessarily captures everything about what cooperation is all about, because we live in this very complex, entangled world. Um, oftentimes, I don't think we understand people's incentives within them, and that causes different things. We make different assumptions in our models and don't actually they don't actually reflect what people are actually doing or thinking. It's all very complex. And so can we say it's solved? I think we understand a lot. Um, I still think there's a lot to be understood. I mean, we have bullying in schools, for example. Um, that's a form of cooperation with some people and at the same time a, a non-cooperation with others, right? We have so wars. Wars, we have keep, wars. We keep starting wars. Divorce. Right? <laughs> Exactly. Um, things that we in some ways understand, but don't can't we, we certainly can't, don't solve it in the sense that it's still while humans are good at cooperating, we are actually bad at it at the same time. And even though it's not solved, do you decide at some point in your career, you're a computer scientist like myself, and you don't start by studying AI cooperation, but at some point you start to get more interested in human cooperation, and then you say, well, I'm actually gonna go one step ahead and say. What if humans and machines can cooperate? How did you start studying human cooperation 
and eventually moved on to Human AI Corporation. Walk me through that path of your work. Yeah, good question. So I think as a computer scientist, I, I'm not very good at interacting with people. <laughs> and so I think I was intrigued with this question of how, how should people interact with each other? How is it that you produce, how do you, how do you forge cooperative relationships? Um, at the same time, it, you know, I think the question was how do we, you know, what are the mechanisms that will bring about cooperation? Um, and, and so if we, if we code it, encode it into a machine and the machine can produce cooperation, then we have kind of a very formal model of what it looks like to produce cooperation. What, what was the first thing you, you set out to do in this line of research that lead, led to the, essentially you, you were uh, the lead author of the first paper, which was able to show that humans yeah. and machines can cooperate on timescales that are relevant for humans. In not in a hundred iterations of I do something for you, you do something for me, or I betray you, you betray me. Not a thousand of them, which is the way AI was able to eventually cooperate, but in tens of them, which is kind of the mm -hmm. timescale that humans normally, you normally will cooperate with people for a few days or a month. It's not that yeah. you have a hundred years to figure out if this person wants to cooperate with you. Yeah. So what was the first step in that path towards so, that paper? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember because <laughs> it was about 15 years ago I started to be intrigued by it. But, but in, in those initial times, we, we were just concerned about trying to, to learn cooperation. We didn't care how fast it was. Mm -hmm. So our initial machine learning algorithms we devised were designed to learn cooperation after 10, 15, 20, hundred thousand rounds of wow. interaction, interaction in the exact same scenario over and over and over again. Um, and what would happen in the, in the transition that the machine would do weird things that essentially would break down cooperation, right? Yeah, it's, it would do it's random... essentially you're playing randomly, right? As it's right. trying to explore I mean, the, the foundations of reinforcement learning, which we were using are essentially you explore and exploit and try to, there's a trade off between exploration and exploitation. Um, and so in using that, that trade-off, I mean, the, the machine's internal models of what values everything would give it um, were essentially random at first anyway, and it slowly learns these things. And so the behavior during that time is very random, mm -hmm. isn't conducive at all to what you would interact if you're going to interact with a person. Uh, after a few rounds, the person would have thrown it away and said, I'm not interacting with, with this. Um, but it did allow us through that process to understand what are some of the mechanisms that lead to cooperation. So you typically, the, typically these machine learning algorithms become myopic and they fall into the trap of localizing their current rewards, which would be defection opposite of cooperation. So we had to kind of study what are some of the, the mechanisms that allow a machine learning algorithm to pull itself out of that local equilibrium and try to, to, to make it look a little more globally. Um, and it's difficult because the other, if you're interacting with another machine, which is what we were doing, they're also acting randomly. So you don't have any strong signals yeah. coming from they, the other. They don't mind each other. Exactly. Being, so, being weird. Yeah. And so as they, and so there was really nothing, I mean, to, to get cooperation and make it beneficial, which is what a machine learning mm -hmm. algorithm needs to see to learn to do it. Um, the other machine needs to demonstrate that I can cooperate right. and you cooperate and things will be good. So... So that was difficult. And so to understand kind of those mechanisms, I think that was the first step. And I think we spent several years, many years, just trying to understand that and achieve algorithms that could learn to cooperate. Um, of course, those were before the days of deep learning. And, and now people are trying to do similar kinds of things with reinforcement learning mm -hmm. algorithms with deep learning and are running into the same kinds of issues because it ends up being a similar kind of process to the typical reinforcement learning, very, learning algorithms we were using back then. But uh, was it just a time thing? Was it just that you needed to make it faster? Or were there other factors hindering cooperation between humans and yeah. machines? Because it seems that that's a big one, right? If, if you're going to start interacting with you know, some, a machine on the phone, 30 seconds in, yeah. if, if you're not getting <laughs> something reasonable, you hang up and say, please give me a human agent. Yeah. But were there other factors? Definitely. So, but that, that was the first one we we. Dis we figured we had to solve. So I would say probably 2003, 2002 is when I became again, okay. really interested. And then I dabbled in other things along the way. It was probably 
2013, 2014, 2015, 2013, that we finally felt like we had an algorithm that could learn to cooperate and, and re respond well to somebody within a few rounds of interaction and figure out when cooperation would be beneficial as opposed to not. The, the problem with that is that then we thought, oh, ha ha, we have an algorithm. We tried it out in experiments when, when paired with people and we learned that the algorithm failed, right? It wasn't able to establish these cooperative relationships with people, even in these rather simple kind of games. So it was, it was working in computer simulations, right? Yeah. It was yeah. working in short time scales, in this relevant time scale, when playing other simpler algorithms, right? But not when you actually put it in the real experimental with humans yeah, setting, right? Yeah, whenever we bring people in there, I think we immediately realized our the interaction seemed very unnatural to people. So, so what we were doing is we were essentially, you know, obscuring the identity of your partner and you just play these games as traditional through a computer mm -hmm. screen with another person. Um, Did they know it was a machine? When, when you... Yeah, we would do different kinds to guess? of studies, but often, yeah, typically we wouldn't tell them is it a machine or a, a person. Um, so even if it is very stylized, Simpler, very simple games where you essentially get the prisoner's dilemma. Do you cooperate with me? Yeah. Even then, they could feel it wasn't, it wasn't a human. And they could guess it right. Well, I think the interaction was just not natural for what... I mean, to play these games isn't very natural, right? That's not, that's not a normal life. Right. In normal life, we, 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 we say a lot and do very little. So often we'll talk about things for a long time. Is that cheap talk? Is that cheap, what you call it? Cheap talk. We'll, yeah. we'll refer to this just to, as cheap talk. And then, we, and then we do things, right? So there's always, almost always some kind of signaling before we do something. And that's actually what we realized is that these interactions that we had didn't, didn't model reality because there was none of that back and forth. You and know, so as we change those, as soon as we change those studies, we, we'd see a different switch come on in, in people's heads and they acted completely differently. And that made us realize, hey, we actually need a machine. The machine's got to be able to do the same thing. It's got to be able to talk about its mm -hmm. internal processes. It's got to be able to take input from what the other person's saying and then use perhaps the same kind of learning mechanisms it was using before, but now incorporate communication, which we, which we refer to as cheap talk, non-binding. Um, say whatever you want, but that somehow seems to trigger a different kind of reaction in, in people. And, and so we felt like a machine needed to do the same thing. Well, I'll tell you a story from one of the studies that we were running. So this was one of the first studies where we had people actually talking to a machine or another person they didn't know which through this computer interface. And the experimenter was going around monitoring, making sure everything was, was set up well with the, and the study was going okay. And he noticed that what we'd do is we'd have them talk, you'd say what you were going to say through a computer interface and then the, the machine would voice it through headphones on the other end because then that was our way of hiding the identity. But still, we, we figured it was important to have the audio signal coming through rather than just showing uh -huh. text. And he, the experimenter noticed, the person running the study noticed that that person had taken off their headphones and he says, well, can you put your headphones back on? He, I don't want to, and he said, I don't want to hear this guy. And, and we noticed this guy was was not they were they were not having a very good relationship. I don't want to hear this guy. <laughs> and and so then and the experimenter walked away and a little while later as he came back and noticed again and the 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 subject had the headphones back on. And he was and then he was well, what 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 is happening to cause him to put it back on and they had begun to cooperate. And as soon as they began to cooperate, he it seems like he was receiving some kind of reward signal for putting the for, for the, the speech that was coming through. And so he put his headphones back on so that he could now hear the nice things that his partner was saying about him. That Those. is fascinating. So <laughs> so your willingness to actually talk to somebody is somehow correlated or causally linked to yeah, how perhaps, yeah. how well you're actually working with this person. Uh, what what do you think precedes what? Right? So you say, in, <laughs> I'm going to jump to your, your probably next paper, but yeah. I want to stay on this a bit. Yeah, yeah. But you, in, in the next paper, uh, which you title, How AI Wins Friends and Influences People, okay, yep. you have this old saying, if you have nothing, if you don't have anything nice to say, better to say nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so in that, yeah. Okay, yeah, so. so is, it, is it kind of the same thing that, yeah. is it 
you're, you're in a bad place, you say something nice, and then you're back cooperating? Or do you think it's better to show, well, listen, I'm going to cooperate with you, and then, okay, well, now I believe whatever you say, or I want to hear whatever you say. Yeah, well, how so, do you think it works? So this, uh, like back up to the, the study you're referring to a little bit, where we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, we'd, we'd created this algorithm that now seems like it can cooperate with people. It talks, it responds to the signals, the, the, the cheap talk, the, the user, the, the human on the other end is giving. People had a hard time kind of distinguishing it from people um, because they're playing through this interface and it seemed to have similar kind of characteristics. And, but one thing that we did notice is that our algorithm was, a, it sent more what we would call hate messages to its, its associate than the, than the human did. Um, That's interesting. Which, which we thought was strange. And then we looked at how humans responded and they responded, actually they were nicer to the machine than they were to other people, seemingly trying, they, they said more messages of praise and, and things like that. Of the machine. Try, well, I don't know. I think it was just they're trying to settle down the situation. Mm -hmm. So they said nice things to try to you know, redirect things. And that kind of got us thinking a little bit, well, how should the machine talk? Um, you know, going back to even the first study that we had where we had the machine talking, um, the machine actually bullied the, the first couple people that we put through the study because it, it talked kind of tough and people thought, well, I can't do anything about it. Of course, Whoa. then we realized that, that seemed to be an anomaly, but there was some essence of, you know, this very strong behavior. So we started thinking, well, how should you talk? Um, so so we, we kind of looked for, well, what are kind of the philosophical ways that you talk? One of them is that every parent says to their child, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That seems to be one philosophy. Um, Dale Carnegie in his book, How to w Win Friends and Influence People, outlines a theory for a bunch of other things. That's um, like 12 things. That yeah, a, lot right? of, a lot of things. And like so, things yeah. That, yeah. Do you remember any of them? So use the other person's name, um, ask them questions, praise them, never criticize or complain about them. Be interested in their hobbies. There's something about the hobbies that people really cherish. And he said, if, you, if they mention a hobby, be very interested in it. Yeah, yeah, somehow yeah. That's yeah. very close to their heart. So, I mean, all of these things that we kind of believe to be true. Yeah. Um, but then you... On, on the flip side, or maybe a third convention is we see maybe among political figures, or we won't name, who send tweets and say things that are completely opposite to perhaps that line of, of thought, right? That don't seem to embody the it principles pr proposed by Dale Carnegie. And in many instances, well. they seem to rise to power uh -huh. in, in different kinds of ways. So that, that was kind of our like idea. Man, so, like being, showing strength by, in a sense, Putting people down, right? So that's what yeah. The, the put strong. down, the criticism, yeah. um, dark humor. This yeah, almost abrasive yeah. And, way. And, and one thing you know, one of Del Carnegie's statements is is talk in terms of the other person's interests, and that other line of thought seems to only talk in terms of your own interests, right? And and so there seems to be a I polar see. opposite, but yet you know you you could argue that there's been some successful figures talking in that way. So I started to think, well, what's the impact? of having our machine now talk in different ways. We already have it, it's, it's talking, it's, it's reflecting what its internal processes are doing and speaking, well, you could say it in different ways. How does that impact how people did? And so we, we matched different personalities. One we called the, the Dale Carnegie personality. Um, another we'll personality. Nice. We'll be re a really nice. He's a nice guy. He's trying to implement all Dale Carnegie's principles that he outlines in, in this book. Okay. Don't criticize, don't complain, Was talk in terms of the other person's interest. To translate the lessons to actual computational actions? Was it hard to. In our case, no. I, I okay. think it was, just, it was just a different manner of saying, you know, our mechanism for having the algorithm talk was look at the internal state and parameters or in this particular kind of state, these are the kinds of things you would say, mm -hmm. we can reflect it in a different way mm -hmm. with these different personalities. Um, so we had the Carnegie Prince or the Carnegie character. We had the, the Spock character, which is the um, kind of robotic, no feelings. Uh -huh. Very rational. Yeah. No praise or nice words. Just exactly. Truth. And then we had what we called the Biff personality after Biff Tannen and Back to the Future, which was kind of your bully-like uh -huh. character. Um, 
And then we had a silent one, which is embodying this, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, which we're juxtaposing against this, this Biff character. Mm -hmm. um, and so we ran a study to compare and contrast, you know, what kind of payoffs does a machine get based on the things that they say? Um, and, and we altered, we did alter the, the learning algorithm it's using to, to make decisions to try to try, we tried out two different kinds of learning algorithms, one more capable than the other to see whether a mix between the capabilities and the, the you know, the speech preferences of the um, robot would change anything of, of how well, what payoffs it got and how people perceived it. Would they like to continue to interact with it? Did they trust it? Did they think highly of, of this machine character? Um, and so we ran a, a, a set of studies through to explore those kinds of things. Um, what we found out is that the very worst thing you could do would be uh, to be competent but silent. Competent by silent. Competent by silent. So this would, this would kind of refute this idea that if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, because if you were competent and rude, you did much better and actually seemed to even be appreciated more. And it appeared to be, so, so if you didn't say anything and you were very competent, people kind of viewed you as you're untrustworthy. They didn't know what to expect from you. You're kind of the silent enemy, perhaps, because people don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you're, um, you seem cunning, right? You seem, you perhaps they're yeah. cunning, right? And so, and, and that was the very worst thing. They cooperated less. People didn't want to continue uh -huh. to interact with them. They didn't trust them. Um, that was kind of the worst. Um, the best actually was to be a comp have competent behaviors and then comp and combine that with Dale Carnegie's principles. We did notice that the, the Biff-like character, which is rude and bullies, it, it maintained the same level of cooperation um, when forced to continue to interact with with people, but it, um, people didn't like it as well, and so the, the, it, they didn't they, they didn't want to continue to interact with it. It which, wouldn't get to the maximum level of cooperation. It, it would hit the right. same level of cooperation, yeah. but but people then wouldn't want to continue to yeah. interact with it, and so they'd kind of like, oh, I'd rather go interact. Okay, with you want this one? Bye. I don't want to see you again, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so th th that would kind of suggest if you're forced into an interaction. Maybe it doesn't matter so much if they're rude or nice or something, but it, once, once there's this opportunity to get out of the, the, the relationship, then that matters because now you're not going to be able to have that partner to cooperate with anymore. Um, so that's, that's so kind the of... principles do work in the sense that that conventional wisdom when translated into actual... In our studies, yeah. It said, yes, yes, they seem to work. People appreciated it. That was, that was the sweet spot. Um, and it worked whether you were competent or incompetent in your actual behaviors. Um, you're much better off if you followed, you know, these principles espoused by Dale Carnegie as opposed to behaving kind of rudely and, and reflecting your own. But that was primarily with respect to not the, the level of cooperation you met, but at the level of what, what are people actually thinking about you. Um, which, which you could maybe say is reflecting what's happening in, in society now. But. I was rereading your paper and then I, I read uh, excerpts of uh, Carnegie's book and the criticism. And um, <laughs> the main criticism, because as you, as you said yesterday when we were having dinner, is not that it's a scientific book like your papers are. It's actually self-help. And in that sense, it's more in the realm of literature. And it has to be evaluated in, well, you know, given that it's not scientific, what kind of society, what kind of worldview does this book project, right? And the main criticism by literary critics and, I guess, opinionators of the time was that it might, and it's funny because it would coincide with um, what sometimes the European view of, uh, or the continental European view of Americans is, right? Uh, the criticism said that the problem with this book is that it, it does work, but it works in, a, in the sense that it transforms everyone into a very nice <laughs> utilitarian person who is also only nice because they want yeah. something out of it. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think uh, maybe, fair enough. Uh, they, uh, you know, I, it, what we're doing isn't, isn't supposed to try to reflect right. off of that work. You know, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think it's a, it's a good read. Um, 
but here we're, 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 we're mainly looking, okay, there are different theories for how you could talk. Let's try it out on a machine. Of course, the, all the signals are specific to the, the, that we give are specific to the experiences we've had in the past. And so if everybody has become this nice, conniving kind of person, we all have these people that are very nice, but we don't trust them, <laughs> right? right? Because we, we think they're trying to get something out of us. And I think, you know, as you interact with something more and more and more, you, you become familiar with, hey, what are, what are they trying to get? Or really, this person yeah. genuinely cares or, or whatnot. So do you think the criticism is true? For instance, Warren Buffett took the course. Apparently, this was a course at some point whenever the course was on and Warren Buffett took it at age 20 and apparently he still has a diploma for the course in his current office. You, you, he took the, the Dale Carnegie course? Is yep. that, oh, okay. And that's what Wikipedia says at least. I don't know if it's true, but uh, do you think that's true that somehow this prescriptive self-help or in the best case actually useful way because corporate Let's agree that cooperation in society and today, we're going to talk about more, more about this later, I have a few questions for you, but it's kind of has broken down, right? So it would be nice to go back to at least a civil yeah. uh, surface <laughs> uh, level, right? Um, but do you think it's true that this book and other books actually help sh uh, change society to be a bit more of this, and get into this kind of mind-body problem, right? That no yeah. matter what is going on inside, you have to keep it nice and yeah. Clean. Well, well, I think um, I think there's certainly times to to be strict, right? Um, but but I, as I you know I, I don't necessarily take this kind of literature as the exact science for what everybody should do. I would, I would say I think Carnegie was, was mindful of that as he's talking about these principles. And he, he would say, hey, praise the other person, but don't use flattery. And he's saying these things should arise from a genuine feeling of what you are and that people can actually tell those kinds of things. Um, that said, I, I would find contradictions in where you could strategically scheme in, in his stories that seem to strategically scheme and get things out of people. So I don't know, but, but it is a, regardless, it's an intriguing question of, you know, if I, if I had a machine that, that needs to be able to cooperate with people, how would I make it talk in a way that, that, that is genuine to people and so that they don't think it's just trying to get something out of it? So that, I think that would be a steeper level a deeper level that we would need to continue to pursue this. I think in some sense our initial studies are, are intriguing, but they're somewhat surface level, right? And there's not a long enough of a interaction with, with machines to kind of see what's going to come out of this. But I, I think, I think the uh, criticisms could be appropriate. I, uh, all I would say now is that hey, in the principles that we tested out in the limited experiments, these repeated games that we, we did, they, they tend to work pretty well. Um, so, so which bring me, brings me to my, uh, my favorite uh, philosophical, philosophical conundrum, which um, is, is, Paul, is first enunciated by David Chalmers, the Australian, I believe he's Australian uh, philosopher uh, of mine. And he created this, uh, this concept of a philosophical zombie. A philosophical zombie is just a... Uh, a human without consciousness and the, the idea is that if you were to have a human with consciousness uh, and you pinch this human and uh, this human is gonna scream in, in pain say please stop stop this uh, and you're gonna stop it because you see a, a conscious reaction and if you were to <laughs> in a way uh, create another human which is exactly the same looks exactly the same uh, has the same kind of life trajectory but it's just, not, it's just not conscious, except when you pinch this other human, this exact replica, it's going to scream and kick and scream the same way. Um, so the Chalmers said that it couldn't be the case, right? So this second unconscious human will have no experience, will have no qualia. There will be no qualia of pain. There will be no qualia at all inside. Um, so Chalmers used this argument for uh, against materialism, right? Would say, well, 
it can be the case that everything's in the brain because if everything's in the brain, you could actually operate at a level where you have exact replicas of things that are conscious. Uh, there would be no difference and those, that other thing would be unconscious, right? And it would, it would, the argument kind of about the, the conclusion of that would be, well, therefore consciousness and qualias are not in the material world. He has hmm. ideas of where they could be, and there is a, there are even hints of a duality of reality, right? Where uh, there is the world of qualia, and there is the world of sensations and physicality and the brain. And uh, of course, that that, are, that uh, idea has been criticized by Daniel Dennett, among others, saying that, for instance. Even though logically it makes sense, you would not be able to build a human that would have this simulated experience of pain without actually uh, feeling pain. That it would, you would not be able to design that computer. Just it, would, it wouldn't work. It would actually need to feel pain for it, for pain to be believable. And so that's a 34-year-old philosophical okay. without solution. It's been brought back up in the age of AI, which is why I want to ask you this. Because now we're building AIs much faster than we're able to understand consciousness, right? So it seems that consciousness okay. is kind of stuck there. Whereas in AI, every, every, I'm reviewing papers for AAAI this year. You probably are too. And it's just amazing what we're able to do in computer vision. So in, in coming back to cooperation is uh, the worry with the AI Zombie problem would be that we will build AIs that will be able to do many things, but they wouldn't be conscious. And if AI were to take off and colonize the universe, <laughs> it'd be very sad that somehow the one thing of human experience that we value, which is experience, would not exist in this to this next generation being. But at the same time, that would not prevent it from colonizing the universe, right? So the universe would be mostly populated by beings that are unconscious. So <laughs> do you think the equivalent in cooperation could be the case that you're at the front, forefront of building these machines, you're making them cooperate, but you don't know if they want to cooperate? I think you see where I'm going, right? Yeah. Are you worried that we end up building cooperative zombies in the same way that Chalmers was worried that we're building AI zombies without consciousness? Yeah, good question. I, I think perhaps I don't understand all the, the philosophical, philosophical nuances that you're referring to a little bit, but, but I think a related question that I, you know, I've pondered is what is it that makes, ultimately makes a machine different than a human? We have lots of different examples over the last few decades, particularly you know, the last few years where machines are doing something better than humans do it, but they're usually very narrow kinds of tasks. Um, and so the question, and, and, and this, you know, so I think it begs the question is ultimately what makes a human and a machine different? Um, and so I thought about that a little bit. And, and ultimately, I, I believe it comes down to, to what a machine wants versus what a human wants. Who is it that gets to dictate it? I think the machine ultimately is, is told what it wants by the designer, whereas we as humans have the ability to choose what we want. All of what the machine wants seems to come from the programmer, the person that's endowing it with these abilities, then also tells it at the same time what it wants. And, and AI, in my, my perspective, has had very little to say about where does this utility come from and how can we create things that can want, if we'd even want to do something like that. Um, and all the, the AI seems to focus primarily on how to, if we want something, what are the processes? How can we learn how to get it and, and do that behavior? And so to me, that seems to differentiate the human from, from machines is our ability to choose our pursuits, choose what we desire to some degree. Now, obviously, we, we have emotions and different instincts that seem to want to give us or want us to get different kinds of things, right? But, but then we have the ability to choose whether we want to pursue different kinds of enticements. And the ability to choose that is really what makes us intelligent. Choosing the rewards uh, before, rewards. We, before we actually even think how to solve the problem. 
Yeah, I would say, yeah, choosing goals, choosing rewards, I think some of these terms can mean, they're rather nuanced, and I'm not sure yeah. I'm getting all of them want, but to choose your pursuits is what we can do. And, and ultimately, we're slaves to what we choose to pursue, as is the machine. What makes us intelligent is our ability to choose those pursuits. So that would be my kind of response to this, this even though it's not answering directly this question, I would say, I'm not sure we're... I'm not sure we're too getting to the question you're asking of, of a machine ecology that's doing things and not having consciousness. Because right now, I think anything that we've, we've created so far is a machine that is doing the will of somebody that endowed it with a particular goal or pursuit. Um, so, so let's say that you are presented with two of, I know your algorithms, you like to call them, S++, S+, S sharp. So let's say that you have a bunch of them. And uh, I kept insisting on this question of conscious cooperation, right? And say, you know, uh, Jacob, I'm, I'm about to buy this algorithm out of you. I'm ready, I'm ready <laughs> to pay billions of dollars for it. It's going to go on every machine in the world, every cell phone in the world. But I need to make sure that this machine actually wants to cooperate. And reduce this question to, let's say, two algorithms, right? So two of them are pretty good at establishing cooperation. You were to look at the specifications, and both of them would have, you know, over 90% cooperation over 10 rounds, over, like, med like medicine, right? Over 90% sure. over... Both capable of, of forging cooperative relationships, yeah. And I were to ask you, right, but which of them wants to cooperate more? Which of them is more generally... As you say, yeah. the value system, the reward system. Would you be able to answer <laughs> well, that question? It, well, yeah, I think, I, think, I think that gets to the root of the question. I, I don't know that AI has a, an answer to it. I mean, someone could imbue it and say, well, well I, what you can do, what people have done is that they say, well, okay, the rewards, you, guys, you create something that's very cooperative, which is that I'm just going to have our rewards be the sum of, of my rewards and the other the other party's rewards. Um, so that, that naturally removes all conflict, right? Should make Absolutely. cooperation easier. At issue now is that you have an algorithm that isn't looking after your interests. So you're purchasing an algorithm. You can have algorithm A, which looks after your interests, or algorithm B that is programmed to cooperate. And if you choose the one that's programmed to cooperate, now you've opened yourself to being exploited because someone yes. else can come along and exploit you. So, so I think, to, to me, it seems, it seems to make sense to say, hey, let's, let's have an algorithm that looks after its interests. Um, but in order to get its interest, it's going to have to be able to forge a cooperative relationship with others. And that seems to be a way that would be effective. And, and in so doing, it, it can then, you know, try to try to avoid being exploited, um, which seems to be a, an important characteristic of establishing cooperation. Because I, I feel like I'm, you're unlikely to establish cooperation if people feel like they can exploit you. Um, yeah, so you, you actually mentioned narrative um, in, a, in a paper, of very recent paper of yours, I think it's from this year. Uh, so it seems that in many ways, I think the reason why you're looking into narrative is because I think coming back to this philosophical cooperative zombie question, oftentimes I think we end up cooperating with people when in many ways we feel the humanity of this other person that you say, well, this person was very upset with me, but see, even though that person was upset, did something that was not in their interest, even though that was kind of a blunder, right? So I think through blunders, you see a lot of this, somebody's soul, right? So um, if people are perfect, you tend to see them as more outer, out, outer world, right? Yeah, yeah. When people are imperfect, <laughs> right? Uh, you, you see to see them more, more human, right? And then the, your narrative, I would like to ask, it seems that narrative in cooperation, in AI cooperation, is the next frontier, right? That if you look at um, all these kind of these six types of telling stories, they all have a structure of yeah. rise and fall in different places with different people, right? Um, and in many of them, at, just, at some point, they show the vulnerability of the hero. 
so you empathize with them. Mm -hmm. you, you want you want yep. the hero to win. How are you working on putting that back into yeah. AI? Tell, tell me about it. So so what, kind of kind of what spurs this on is suppose you have a an algorithm in your home for secure that does home security for you, and it's in charge of you know getting the right temperature, dimming the lights. And it's using some kind of machine learning algorithm to try to figure out what you want. It's invariably going to make mistakes. And it seems like as, as humans, as, as stories go, we're okay with the hero making mistakes. Yeah. As long as we can see and project into the future, there is, it's, it's, he's going to learn or he or she's going to learn. And so our thought is we need to have the, the human be able to, or the, the machine that's being the security system to be able to portray the same kind of thing. Um, and so one way you could do that, I'm, I'm invariably going to make mistakes, but then I should be able to talk to you about it and form kind of a narrative of, hey, this is what's happened with our relationship. And exactly. I recognize maybe I made a mistake here. I'm actually not very competent right now because I'm just learning, but I, I, I am I'm using some processes that will eventually make me become very competent, stick with me a little bit, and in our future, I'm gonna be very capable for you, right? And there you kind of lowered the expectations because again, if it doesn't talk and say anything, you throw it away and this, this piece of junk, it just goofs up. But now if you can form some kind of a narrative that establishes the correct current expectations and the current expectations for the future, now people are willing to accept something that's imperfect. They just have to be able to interact with it and know how they're going to be able to get what they want out of it. And when it makes mistakes, realize it's not going to always do that. It could potentially progress and move on from that. And even being able to realize its own mistakes is, is critical and it needs to be able to express this and build some kind of narrative. So it's, you know, and, and I don't know what, what kind of narrative structure we end up ultimately should use for these kind of things, but it seems like humans think in terms of these narratives and so that if we can make machines be able to express them, then, then you can establish for these long-term relationships. Otherwise, people are going to cut them off and say, I don't want this. I'll take a different technology. So what, what kind of narratives are you, in that paper, trying to inject into the algorithm? How, how is an algorithm able to explain these narratives back about their own, their own yeah. mistakes? Their well, own... I mean, this is, this is early work that we haven't solved a lot of kinds of things. But, but what we're... You know, the kinds of things that we're really finding, thinking are important is you, um, for, in particular, there's attrition. You've got to be able to attribute particular events to something. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, and so attrition is one of these important attribution. I'm saying the wrong word. Attribution is one of these important um, terms for a narrative. Um, and who do you put blame on? You know, I can put blame on the stupid people at headquarters that have given me this mm -hmm. algorithm. I could put blame, often the customer service or something might make a mistake and put a blame on the, the customer that they didn't set the machine correctly and that's why the machine then made a mistake. Or you could say, put blame on, hey, the machine itself is just learning. So there's this blame. Itself, yeah. And then there's gotta be this aspect of repair. How do you repair this problem that's arisen mm -hmm. in this story, or this, in this case, this relationship that's evolved? Um, and then, but that, that suggestion for how to repair it, it's got to actually be correct. Otherwise, people say, well, you told me this is going to happen, and you've been telling me for this for a month, and nothing's ever changed. I don't believe you anymore, mm -hmm. right? So there's got to be some realism, some belief, some accuracy. Um, so, so we are looking at the specific aspects of narrative and saying, hey, what, these are probably critical to creating an engaging relationship that people can buy into and agree to. Um, but the exact mechanisms for how to pull it off is, is something we're still looking at. Though, if, you know, we, we kind of in the paper you're referring to point back to this prior work on cooperation. How do we create a machine that that can interact effectively with people? And we're able to pull out the things that the machine is actually saying do match many of these different kinds of narrative that you need that, that, that occur in stories. And we did that on accident. But but and oh, yeah. so so to look at it in more detail and, and try to figure that out seems like you can build up a better way of communicating this cheap talk. You can improve your cheap talk by tuning into the narrative kind of story which we often seem to talk about and, and enjoy. So 
So, so uh, it seems that in many ways, uh, one, one possibility of, for evaluating your work is you're trying to put a bit of the old into the new, right? So you're trying to look at, well, how were we, were we told that we could make people happy and cooperate with them? Well, we could, we could be nice to them, we could be truthful to them. And these are things that our parents, our grandparents, our, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, our bosses would tell us. And it seems kind of ancient wisdom, right? In the same way that you're trying to put that, you're trying to put cheap talk, which at the end of the day is uh, the way we are socialized, right? So most of what we say means nothing, but that if you remove that, then society crumbles, right? And the, the latest is we, we have this thirst for stories and Sometimes we're willing to take pain or we're willing to take losses if, as long as we have a good story, right? So you're trying to put these old school concepts into AI, which is yep. the future, precisely in a time where it seems to me that all these old school concepts are actually shattering, right? So if you look at uh, the way we are consuming information today, uh, in many ways experiencing our emotions, um, it would actually go against a narrative. It would actually go against wisdom. It would go against history. And it would go against uh, pretty much anything that has any whiff of the past, right? So I think I've been very recently reading books about uh, we have what happened after postmodernity. So you have postmodernity, which is the relativization of experience, right? In many ways, postmodernity would mean that there is not one way of explaining the world. There are many of them and you are part of it. You are part of that world and your, traject your life trajectory really shapes uh, the reality that you perceive and that's valid. And there are kind of two steps more, which is you have hypermodernity, which is, well, in many ways, you don't really have a way of seeing the world. You have a, a way of seeing the world right now. So hypermodernity is quintessentially characterized by social media and instantaneous uh, pulling of information into your into your psyche, and the only thing that matters in this uh, moment is, in many ways, what you feel about this right now, right? So, the, so if you if you were to look at what an average person mode of existence in, in the developed world is, this person is being bombarded with information that is specifically targeted to elicit strong emotions, and those emotions go back into a pool where they get normally amplified so that other people can feel them. And then when the emotion pool has been depleted, we go back to the, to the next, right? I see this process as in many ways the um, neglecting the prefrontal cortex processing. Mm -hmm. So going back to the more cerebellum reptilian way of acting. And my, my, what I want to ask you is, it seems that now we are in a breach of cooperation in society that nobody trusts anyone. Everything, everything is, um, everything is kind of a, a, a conflict. Uh, there are micro conflicts at the level of, uh, you know, the more menial things. But those micro conflicts, they seem out of scale, but seem almost as important as the biggest conflicts, right? So it seems that we are constantly. Yeah. Do you think AI, right? Because the reason why these machines, these, these social media platforms, are able to bombard you so efficiently is because they have learned how to. The learn is the AI part. Do you think the problem is that the AI that flooded the system first <laughs> was extremely non-cooperative and almost adversarial against humans? And that's the end of history, right? That it doesn't matter that we have better AIs, the mode of thinking has essentially changed back to that more reptilian mode. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if I, I know the full answer. I, I think it's interesting to think of, well, let me tell you a story um, that may touch on this a little bit. So, so after we had published this paper, Cooperating with Machines, mm -hmm. I had a, um, there was a guy, uh, the, I was on the Matt Townsend show, and this guy's kind of a marriage therapist kind of guy. And, you know, I, what do I know about this kind of thing? But he, you know, he was intrigued to, to ask about, hey, you know, how do, how do machines cooperate? What's going on? And, and he made an interesting observation, I think, that he, well, in his marriage counseling, he, he was able to, 
to pinpoint, he, he could kind of identify, hey, th this is not going to go well. The emotions have started to spike. I know exactly that this conversation, this relationship now is going to go downhill. Whatever we do now is not going to work. Wow. And so, and, and his kind of point was that, hey, the, the, we can probably use AI to, to help ourselves out in these situations because we all get into these situations, some of us more than others, right? Where we begin thinking, we have cognitive issues. Catastrophizing. Yeah, um, where, where we begin to get into some negative thoughts cycles or in negative emotions that just kind of overwhelm our ability to cooperate. And, uh, and so I think there's an opportunity, while there may be a lot of negative things out there, there's an opportunity to use AI technologies in a way that help us to overcome these potentially natural weaknesses that we have to, to perhaps change the conversation back to more civil tones. Um, so that would be my response is I don't think we can necessarily blame our situation on machines and, and, and things like that, but, but to notice that as we over engage in social media and, and see only particular kinds of perspectives that can jade us and the anger can start rising, I think there's an opportunity to develop things that could hey, look at things more objectively and, and try to help us to overcome some of our um, kind of a negative emotions that, that make us so that now we no longer think very clearly and we can no longer engage in these meaningful cooperative relationships because we shut them down. So, and, and, so and that partly goes back to why I think I was interested in studying cooperation in the first place is how do we, how do we figure out what allows us to cooperate? Are there certain mechanisms within us that cause us not to be able to cooperate and develop good you know, working relationships with other, as opposed to are there processes in us that we could activate that allow us to do so? And, and I think we can learn a lot from different perspectives and the AI perspective on what generates cooperation, I think can be, can be useful for that conversation. So I don't know if I'm directly answering your, your question or, you know, of where you're going, but, but to me, there seems like there's a great opportunity to use AI technologies to help us to you know, not, I'm not trying to say manipulate us, but to help us to, to, to see things a little clearer. My follow-up and sample uh, question on your optimistic take is, I agree on that. I feel it's, it's a situation very similar probably to the, to the tobacco situation in the 70s and 80s and the fast food in the 80s and the 90s that, yeah. okay, we knew that eating fast food was bad. But somehow it was too late, right? So I, my feeling is that even with smoking, <laughs> even with smoking, right? I feel everyone knows that smoking is bad for you, right? Everyone knows that eating yeah. fast food is bad for you. And somehow, because society has already changed, so just to get very philosophical if you want, right? So as a continental, uh, amateur philosopher, I always uh, try to look at, okay, well, what were the conditions that set, uh, were set in motion so that fast food was a thing, right? So fast food, surely they figure out how to make it delicious and fake delicious and uh, whatnot, but it was probably the conditions of a society that needed fast food to exist, right? Or it was a society that needed tobacco to exist uh, and, then, and then, of course, the market conditions are created and this, this works, right? My worry with, the, with this more benevolent AI that you're building that I think it can come soon enough versus the more, it's almost this reptilian AI, right, that we have flooding the system is that I don't know how we're going to get out of this local minima, right? I don't know if anyone is going to want to have to, to want to taste that more competitive AI, given that we already are getting used to the reptilian AI. <laughs> and do you, do you agree that there might be kind of a cold start problem, right? So who's going to use now, let's say that, <laughs> yeah, let's say that you and I have a Facebook 2.0 type of platform that is going to give you information in a cooperative way so that you declare that you want to read books about Victorian 
uh, you know, Victorian, Victorian, Victorian literature or Egyptian history, and you want to get snippets of books so that eventually you, you read all of them as, instead of the news of the day. Just as that's, that platform feels a, di a bit different, feels a bit slower, feels that you have to invest more time, you have to put more yourself in it. And this other one still exists, right? And it, it seems more fun and it's, it's only one up away. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> do you agree that it's gonna be tricky? Well, I, you know, I, I, to be honest, I think it, it, I don't know that the full answer is AI. I, I think actually we, we go back, I mean, I, personally speaking, I think we go back to, you know, as, as individuals, we can make good decisions for us to help, to, to choose to, to, to act in a good manner. I mean, I think that ultimately all the, the, the plagues that we see with, with AI doing things that maybe we don't want, they're driven by individuals and organizations that are trying to get things for themselves or trying to manipulate or, or what have not. You know, so I would argue that, it, you know, that those are just reflections of the society that we live in rather than a, the, the AI is bad. Again, I think going back to the, the AI is doing what people are telling it to do. And, and so ultimately it comes down to individuals being responsible in how they employ it rather than can we create AI that fixes the problem to combat the bad AI, which, which maybe is an okay you know, thing to, that, that, that people could try out. But I think ultimately that's, that's fighting a symptom rather than fighting the, the cause. And uh, the, the final question I have, it's uh, about um, a paper that you wrote, which is my favorite paper of yours. Uh, we, we wrote together this paper, Cooperation by Machines, which is probably the most dense technical paper I would ever write. And uh, even when I tried to read it again, I don't think I fully understand what we, what we did together uh, <laughs> because it's, it's quite deep and, and technical. But you actually have one that is even more technical and deep, which is the uh, regulating hybrid AI human ecologies, right? And the question that I want to ask you to, to close this conversation of is given that we are going to have these more reptilian AIs flooding the system, the social media systems, and then the, the better AIs that you're actually building, more cooperative, more stable, do you think we should decide to regulate them, to somehow create a system where all of them are under some rules, and because you studied that in a paper, what lessons did you did you learn of how to regulate these differently sophisticated AIs? Yeah, good question. So in, in that paper that we were that you're referring to, um, we kind of looked at what are the situations in which we'd be able to regulate machines. What makes what makes it easier for us to regulate machines versus not regulate them? Um, we have a tendency, I think, as humans, as organizations, to want to regulate everything. Largely because we want an efficient society that provides, um, you know, provides society or that meets societal goals, um, and so what we were looking at in that particular paper is is how are what characteristics of the AI algorithms make it easier or harder for us to regulate machines, and so as the machines learn, that means as the regulators impose some kind of new rule, it takes the system, they're learning, and so they adapt, and then they adapt to each other, and so you've got this cycle it's of adaptation, easy, yeah. and the regulator can't really tell what's going on. He can't foresee the cycle of regulation that is happening, and, and therefore he doesn't know how to set up good regulations. Whereas if the, the algorithms are rather simple, then the regulator is able to observe the impact of those regulations and is able to more quickly find a sweet spot. So that's kind of what we observed, and, and it kind of makes sense in this, you know, we look at the financial institutions, these algorithms yes. become extremely complex, right? And, and so how do we regulate them? Well, I don't, no one really understands necessarily what the algorithms are doing, so I think regulation becomes harder, whereas as we, if we had done things to simplify the algorithmic trading or whatever, then regulation, we'd understand a little bit more of the processes. Now, I'm not a financial regulator. I'm not trying to say what, what should happen. I'm just observing, okay, now we have a lot of systems. 
You have different kinds of what we would consider smart grids where buildings are making decisions. They have smart devices or something making decisions about when to turn the lights on, what, how much heat to do based on how much energy is available. And sometimes it, there's, there's a temptation I know in, to, to incentivize peak use pricing or something to try to get people to, or give people rewards for doing different kinds of behaviors. And now, now you've turned the whole system into a game and probably causing the algorithms now to become more complex as they try to learn and we could have the same kind of cycling so we can't, we can't regulate them anymore. Um, I don't know the full answer, it's just it seems like as we add complexity to our AI, we make them more difficult to regulate. As we, as we create regulations that create a game of sorts and mm -hmm. the AI becomes very good at playing the game, playing the game and at you know, finding loopholes through the regulations. Probably, I mean, people are good at this too, but, but I think the, the AI thinks at a different level with different kinds of data yes. and with different kinds of precision and, and, can, and changes its behavior so rapidly and our ability to kind of copy this behavior from machine to machine means that we can have you know, wholesale changes, whereas before things migrate a little more slowly because we think think at different levels. Anyway, this was, I mean, this kind of, I would, I would view it as somewhat preliminary work in saying, hey, you know, there's, there's properties of the system that are going to, to change how we regulate them. And also the regulations are going to change the properties of the, the system, which I think really gets into this topic of machine behavior that, that we need to be able to study is, you know, how does machine behavior change as we regulate things differently and vice versa, right? And there's, it becomes this complex control loops, you know, which have been studied on a theoretical level, you know, throughout many different kinds of disciplines, but we're seeing them play out in, in society now at a particular level where AIs are becoming more sophisticated. And on that note, Jacob, thank you for uh, your participation in this uh, conversations and keep up the amazing work on AI cooperation and that other one that I really love, the one about AI regulation. Okay, well, I appreciate being able to discuss this with you as well.